Well, why not, asks dear Christian. What is it about the Bible that turns you off from it? <laughs> Just a few things? <laughs> um, the claims that are outlandish. We don't believe outlandish things. Nobody believes that Goldilocks and the Three Bears is a work of certifiable authority. You know, so it's hard for me to accept this. And dear Christian says, no, 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 no. The Bible and science are perfectly compatible. And if you think I'm making a straw man here, you know, guess what our protesters said the other day? That exact same thing. Yeah, and this is, this is Ray Comfort's whole spiel. The science and the Bible are in harmony. <laughs> Perverts. <laughs> but you say the Bible and science are in harmony, and this just strikes me as so weird. You don't think that maybe biologists have something to say about the idea of people rising from the dead? <laughs> You don't think that physicists might take issue with the notion that someone could walk on water? <laughs> Einstein does. You don't think that chemists might just shit a brick at the idea that a human being could be converted to a pillar of salt? <laughs> <laughs> a geologist might have something to say about the notion of a worldwide flood that somehow left no evidence. And even if the geologists don't have something to say, I'll wager the historians do have something to say. <laughs> that existed during that time, like, say, Egypt's Sixth Dynasty, made copious records of what was going on in their civilization, but somehow missed being exterminated by a global flood. <laughs> Resilient people they are. <laughs> but for knowing all this, um, astronomers uh, might have a problem with the story in Joshua 10 that says the Earth's motion was halted. Just the Earth's rotation is completely halted. This is an astronomical claim, and astronomers have something to say about that. <laughs> so incidentally, if the Earth was halted so that Joshua and the Israelites would have enough time during the day to go and slaughter the Amalekites, including their young, their women, their, their old, uh, and this seems like a very weird thing for a loving God to do. <laughs> but dear Christian, let's... Let's explain how, how science conflicts with some of those claims. So let's look at that last one. Could the Earth's motion have stopped? Well, when the Earth rotates, it has what's called kinetic energy. Uh, and this must be nullified for the Earth to stop. What nullified it? Magic? Doesn't sound very scientific to me. But e even if that mechanism were to exist, the atmosphere wouldn't stop. And that atmosphere rotates at about 1,100 miles per hour. And if, you, if the uh, Earth were to stop, that would suck like everything up into the atmosphere, including Joshua and the Israelites. <laughs> or they could have drowned. I mean, water doesn't stop when the Earth stops, does it? Um, and for the cherry on top, the, moon, the moon's motion was also halted, in which case it would crash into the Earth. And if any of these things happened, we would have found some wellspring of evidence, some reason to believe it happened, and we found none. But wait, JT. Absence of evidence is not ev evidence of absence. Yes, it is! <laughs> if something didn't happen, or something doesn't exist, what more evidence could we have than the lack of any evidence for it? This seems patently clear to me. Um, all right, so then, if science is so good, JT, how did the universe begin? Or how did life begin? It's actually more simple than you think. A self-replicating molecule formed when a series of fatty acids congealed into vesicles, which, made permeable by convection cycles in a prebiotic Earth, trapped nucleotide monomers, which self-ligated via hydrogen bonds and covalent bond ligation, <gasps> polymerizing within the vesicle to form a primitive cell, after which the surrounding ions increased the osmotic pressure, allowing the cell to acquire lipids from other vesicles, which catalyzed competition and thus evolution. <laughs> possible, dear Christian, that this explanation registers as little more than word soup to you. Uh, and there was a time in my life when it registered as little more than word soup to me. I fixed that problem by going to a biologist at my local university and asking them to explain it to me. He sent me to a chemist who then explained it to me. What I did not do is walk up to any Yahoo on the street and say, hey, can you explain this to me? That you do the latter rather than the former suggests to me that you're not really looking for an answer. More that you're looking for an argument from ignorance. But even if we had no idea whatsoever, <laughs> even if we had no idea whatsoever, a Joe Blow off the street has no idea whatsoever, just because they don't know doesn't mean that you do. So what's the point of even asking this question? Um, 
But do we have to learn every single piece of science just to have a you know, coherent worldview? I mean, neither you nor I, dear Christian, can do that. And this is fine, because we defer to the experts. Every time you step onto an airplane, you're deferring to physicists. Or every time you eat a hamburger, you're deferring to uh, germ just a theory. There are people who understand that. Uh, and this is true for all our lives. Every time we turn on our laptop, make a cell phone call, until we get to subjects like abiogenesis and evolution. And then all of a sudden, suspicion starts to creep in. And this really makes me wonder why. I mean, do you think science is the greatest coup in the history of the world? That we that just laid low for thousands of years, improving the quality of our lives, revealing the mysteries of the universe, only so that just now they can stand in opposition to God? <laughs> <laughs> but there, there are religious scientists, JT. Don't you see there are religious scientists everywhere? And I don't know about everywhere, but there certainly are some religious scientists. Here's two of them. Um, this is uh, Francis Collins, Sir Isaac Newton, both very religious people. But it's plain to see that they don't believe in God for scientific reasons. Otherwise, they'd be publishing papers on the existence of God, you know, submitting these things to scientific peer review, and they're not doing that. I'll get back to what they're doing here in a little bit. I'll just talk about it now, because here's the East um, <laughs> A journalist. And yet he's writing these books in which there are ideas that imply that he has the wherewithal to overturn major parts of our scientific discourse. Why the hell is he telling you? You know? But there are scientific organizations publishing those papers, JT. Here they are right here, the Discovery Institute. They're writing papers on it. I think I just heard P.Z. Myers yell or something. Um, they're writing these papers. Hey, 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 you angels. They are a secular organization. You get right back there. <laughs> but we have these scientists at the Discovery Institute using scientific language, and other scientists in peer review using scientific language. How do we, the scientific layman of the populace, know who's telling the truth. Well, you can actually see in the way they treat each other. Um, I'd like to introduce you to this guy. This is uh, Gregory Perelman. He's a uh, mathematical genius. He solved the Poincaré conjecture. Uh, totally cool guy. And it actually turns out he also really likes ping pong. Um, it's on his Wikipedia page. Um, but uh, the Poincaré conjecture, the thing he solved, is one of seven Millennium Prize problems, for which one of the world's most prestigious mathematics organizations uh, has offered a $1 million prize to anybody who can solve one of them. Now, the Poincaré conjecture is also the only one that's ever been solved, and this is the guy that did it. So complex was his proof that it took a team of the world's greatest mathematicians four years just to confirm it is correct. Uh, the Journal of Science said this was the scientific breakthrough of the year, and that was the first time it was ever bestowed in the area of mathematics. Yet, when they attempted to award him the $1 million dollar prize, he shot it down said no. Several subsequent attempts were uh, made to get him to accept this money, and every time he shot it down. Later, he would receive the Fields Medal for that discovery. Uh, the Fields Medal, as many of you know, is considered the Nobel Prize of mathematics. And he shot that down, too. So here we have a guy who is not seeking any accolades for his work. In fact, he's rejecting them when they're presented. And yet, the academic and scientific community is trying to force them on him, trying to insist that he takes his just due. Why are they doing this with the Discovery Institute? <laughs> Doesn't that seem a little weird to you, dear Christian? But it gets even worse than that. When Perelman finished his proof, do you think he, he went to uh, secretaries and plumbers and restaurant managers and said, hey, look at this thing I just figured out. Let's organize a political campaign to get it into high school textbooks. <laughs> no! <laughs> He went to mathematicians, people who spent their whole lives learning this stuff, to first ensure that he was correct. I mean, doesn't that make sense? So, <laughs> it just seems so absurd to me. Um, the fact that the Discovery Institute is more concerned with your mind, dear Christian, rather than the minds of scientists, should tell you something. Why would they do this? They do it because the scientists and the academics would cash them, but maybe not you. So they fed you this line of misinformation, and not only have they expected you to not do your homework and accept it, they have expected you to share the misinformation further, which you've done by just repeating it to me. 
This not only says a tremendous amount about them, but it says a tremendous amount about what they think of you. I hope in the future you remember who they are and how they operate. 